first say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Um, this seminar actually came out of a bit of the consideration we have had on the increased pressure we have seen from, um, well, China and Russia on, on Europe. And, uh, and from my side also, maybe the lack of coherent efforts to counter that sort of pressure uh, on European members. And I think that we, you've seen a lot of words and we have, have met this with the strong uh, verbal um, countering. But I think that what we've seen is maybe less of a uh, European effort to, to see what we can do. And, and I think that um, what we see is that European Union has a very strong economy. And I think that the strongest weapon, if you want, in the European arsenal is its economy. But even that said, we do see a lot of challenges. And I, what I'm trying to do is to gather some of the best thinkers we have in Europe and to give a few opinions on how to deal with these issues, what can be done, uh, what should we not do, and what is realistic. Um, and also what we're coming out after this is a publication I would like to, to flag for that one, where we also bring in some of the Asian perspectives. Uh, we're trying to see what the experience has been in, for example, Australia, India, and Taiwan, etc. But let me, uh, without much further ado, uh, give you a short introduction to the speakers in the order of uh, where they will speak. We're going to start with uh, Professor Lislot Odegaard, who is a professor at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies in Oslo and a non resident fellow at the Hudson Institute. And Lislot focuses on US China Europe relations, including uh, NATO China relations. And I think this is, um, will be extremely interesting. Teresa Fallon is the founder, will come up next, who is the founder and director of the Center of Russia Europe Asian Studies in Brussels. She is concurrently a member of the Council of Security Cooperation Asia Pacific and a non resident senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And then we will have uh, Friedrich Eriksson, who is the director of European Center of International Political Economy uh, based in Brussels. Um, and he has authored a number of books on international economics and policy. And Frederick was actually voted to be one of the most influential European scholars in Brussels when we had that um, um, sort of designation. Uh, then we have Dr. Susha Anna Ferenci, who is a postdoc research fellow hosted by the Ministry of Science and Technology in Taiwan and assistant professor at the National Donghua University in Hualien. Uh, she's also uh, affiliated scholars to the Department of Political Science at Vrije Universiteit Brussels, the Free University of Brussels, uh, and the head of, so head of the associate network of Nine Dash Line uh, and a research fellow at the Next Generation Foundation Taiwan. Then we will have uh, Roland uh, Tronstein, uh, and uh, he served in the German Bundeswehr, among other things. And he's now the, the, the policy, he was the policy director for the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies. And since uh, 2021, he's the vice president of Global Sec and the head of Global Sec Brussels. And finally, we'll have uh, Vice Minister Arnold, Arnoldas Frankvicius, and I apologize for my pronunciation of the Lithuanian. Um, and he, this is a very interesting, um, we're extremely happy to have the vice minister here. He has, he oversees the Lithuania's European policy shaping, its implementation of the European Union and relations with the European Union institutions. He also been heavily engaged, deeply engaged in its relation with China and Russia. And I think that um, the vice minister will be able to offer us I think it's very deep insights into how Lithuania has managed this current pressure from, well, I think China, and, uh, what we've seen uh, most recently, but also I think Russia. And I think um, 
uh, which one of the leading countries when it comes to, I think, Ukraine and the defense of democracy has been Lithuania. So I'm looking very much forward to that. And actually, it might be good to say that in 2018, um, on this day, Lithuania had its sort of a national day or the signing of their own national independence. So this is also a celebration of Lithuania, which I, you know, would like to commemorate as well. But but much much further ado, Professor Odgar, would you like to take the floor? And I will try to limit the presentations to seven minutes. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you for inviting me to this seminar, which is about, I think, one of the most serious long-term challenges to Europe's economic uh, well-being, uh, which comes from China. And I will discuss the illegitimate market economic practices which China uses in Europe and against Europe in a particular industry. Uh, which is the shipbuilding industry, both commercial and uh, military. The shipbuilding industry was never really high on the European agenda to push back against Chinese industrial policies that undermine fundamental free trade principles, uh, perhaps because it's kind of in a way, in some ways, it's already too late. The days of building big container ships and tankers are long gone. And most of the production has already moved to Asia. And that actually means that very few people with a detailed understanding of what happens are left in Europe to speak up uh, about what, what's going on. China has already become a world champion in shipbuilding. For example, if you look at the world's uh, cargo fleet, it's an example of China's dominant status in this sector. By 2018 already, China designed 52% of the fleet. It built 56%. It financed 39% and it operated 29% of all cargo ships in the world. Europe still has a few remaining strongholds in the global shipbuilding industry. Um, if you look at the mar marine equipment industry, uh, the Europeans uh, are world leaders in products such as propulsion system, large diesel engines, environmental and safety systems, and cargo handling and electronics. And if you look at the European shipbuilding industry, it is still the global leader in the construction of complex vessels such as cruise ships or ferries, mega yachts and dredgers. Uh, and it also still has a strong position in the building of submarines and other Navy vessels. These remaining strongholds are though increasingly also threatened by Chinese plans for dominance in all shipbuilding sectors, for example, China is already gearing up for improved performance in cruise ship construction and is planning to establish a cruise supply chain for sustainable development. And if and when that happens, uh, the shipbuilding industry will largely be a topic for historians to look at in, Euro, and that, in Europe. And that's the way it has gone already in the United States, which cannot really produce ships itself anymore. Um, how has China managed to become dominant in shipbuilding? Well, the key word is access to enormous financial resources from the state. And this is then combined with a strategy of building dual use ship factories with economies of scale. Uh, so the pattern is really much the same as you can find in other sectors such as electric cars and other things where China has gone from insignificance to dominance within a few decades. Uh, so what it does is it uses direct investments, uh, Chinese companies engage in mergers and acquisitions, uh, they form research cooperation agreement with agreements with European companies, and they transfer data in non-physical form. Uh, and in, with you, by using these instruments, China has already made major inroads into the European shipbuilding industry. 
So China copies shipbuilding designs within as little as one year. And usually they also establish a local supply chain to replace the European supply chain. And then in the end, uh, they built dual use ship factories, which allow for economies of scale. So through these legitimate market economic practices, China is positioning itself as an industrial civilian and naval shipbuilding giant, which is capable of significantly reducing the market share of European companies. So Chinese dominance in shipbuilding is not only bad for European competitiveness, in the long term, it could also lead to a loss of standard setting influence uh, because China is experimenting with the establishment of a standardization organization that would be available to partners of the Chinese Silk Road Initiative, which is China's vision for global economic development and standard setting may sound boring and not interesting, but it's actually very important because it can be used by China as an entry barrier to markets for countries or against countries that are not part of the Silk Road project and therefore do not have access to the key technologies and designs that are then required to meet the standards. There are also security challenges arising from Chinese shipbuilding uh, that are perhaps the most worrying ones long term. China is on the threshold to establish economies of scale in both commercial and naval shipbuilding, and it produces both types of vessels in large quantities now. China has already through these means quickly expanded its naval force and it continues to develop its navy into a global force to protect China's economic and security interests across the globe. And the, na uh, the Navy's latest both surface and subsurface platforms are key to future naval warfare. China is producing naval platforms at the same production sites as its commercial fleet. And that's why it's dual use factories. And uh, also in this area, China aims for economies of scale to make China a major independent arms manufacturer, a manufacturer in the maritime domain. And this development is what enables China to carry out naval operations on a big scale and also beyond China's immediate neighborhood. Uh, and pose a future threat in regions such as the Americans, uh, uh, the Americas and the Arctic, which is pretty far from China's shores. So in brief, this is, uh, this is some of the challenges that China uh, is raising to Europe uh, in the era of shipbuilding. Thanks. Well, thank you very, very much. <clears throat> I thought that was very sort of informative and especially to the pointer. Um, and before we start doing any questions, I will let all the speakers uh, do the introduction. So, Teresa, the floor is yours. Uh, your, the sound is off. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and invitation to join with this panel and my esteemed colleagues. Uh, there's an old saying in Chinese, to kill a chicken, to scare the monkey. And that's what I think the situation is with Lithuania, but we're talking about the biggest monkey of all in Europe, which is to scare Germany. So I think that this total uh, tightening of this economic warfare, that economic coercion that is going on in Lithuania is to groom and train the rest of Europe to behave. And we have seen this technique used before, uh, especially with the comprehensive agreement on investment. Many analysts thought that this was kind of a misunderstanding, that the Chinese overplayed their hand. But if you look at Chinese uh, newspapers from that time, it was pretty clear that they were trying to train the Europeans to behave and to understand where the red lines were and uh, to really maximize their type of punishment so that Europeans will think twice again about crossing any form of red lines. But uh, this is a watershed moment, of course, the tactics that China is uh, displaying in the dispute with Lithuania 
uh, is important for all countries in the world because we're entering a new era of world disorder. So this idea um, that the WTO, these kind of post-war institutions are kind of creaking uh, under the, the changes in the, the world, the changes in the economy, and it's very difficult to reform them. So yes, the EU has taken this case at a, a rapid clip to the WTO, which is a good sign, but many analysts question if this will really uh, be able to be uh, identified at the WTO level and how long will it take. There are also issues outstanding in regard to the appellate. Uh, the US is kind of blocking certain uh, judges being appointed. So the WTO is not functioning so well, but at least that's one move. But will this really enter into the feedback loop with Beijing? And um, as we understand, there is a lot of gray zone type of punishment that's going on that it's a little more difficult to, to identify. Uh, for example, uh, Lithuania has disappeared uh, in the computer systems uh, for trade so that you know, these are things that are a little more difficult to kind of bring uh, to the WTO, but I imagine that uh, trade lawyers are putting together an effective case. But Chinese gray zone activity uh, and types of punishment, are, I think, are, are rather worrisome and more difficult to push back on. And in addition to that, uh, I, I'm here in Brussels and I've interviewed several people about this. And I would say that there are many people who, who saw it initially as a bilateral issue between uh, Lithuania and uh, Russia, and excuse me, sorry, I've got Russia on my brain, uh, and, and the PRC. And so uh, they felt like they didn't confer uh, with other EU member states when they decided to open this office, and now they feel that uh, they want solidarity, they want support from the EU. But I would argue that at one point it was a bilateral disagreement, but or a bilateral friction between Lithuania and the PRC. But the next step that Beijing took was to Europeanize it. They decided to punish countries that use these types of, uh, they're weaponizing uh, the, I'm sorry, the chains of uh, supply chains. So any components that come from Lithuania will be punished if a country like Germany uses Lithuanian source components in their car industry. So it has a, a really important impact, not just for European countries, but also, for example, US countries, uh, US companies that use Lithuanian parts. So they have chosen to deliberately Europeanize it and internationalize this dispute in order to show the, the strength of their power. Um, over the weekend, there was a meeting in Marseille uh, of EU trade ministers uh, uh, for the French presidency, and they appear united, reportedly, and that they reaffirm solidarity with L Lithuania on this topic, and they fully support steps taken by the Commission, uh, in particularly the framework of the WTO, which is probably a weak response, but I guess that's all they have. But they also stated, and I had to go back to the French uh, statement to double check, and I think it's almost this incredible Freudian slip because they wrote, we are going to prior to prioritize appeasement. So in French, it means kind of to bring things back to kind of peace and calm, but the English translation, which is posted on their website, uh, says that the, they are going to prioritize appeasement, which I think uh, is a, an interesting uh, statement to publish. So we've seen what happened initially with uh, the, the crisis in Lithu Lithuania and the German Chamber of Commerce kind of noted that uh, Lithuania needed to get their act together correctly with Beijing or they would pull out investment. So I think that there was a real lack of solidarity and perhaps a prioritization of appeasement there. And in addition to that, over the weekend, the Financial Times wrote a full page big read about the situation with Lithuania. And they noted that even some Lithuanian entrepreneurs are leaving Lithuania. There was one case of uh, someone in the tech field moving to Belgium. So I think that this is sending a, a huge shock wave, uh, negative messaging to the rest of Lithuania. It's a small country, 1% of their trade is dependent on China, but the fact that they can actually put such asymmetric pressure on Lithuania really does frighten the, the other chickens uh, in the, the coop afraid to send a bigger message to the stronger EU member states to behave. Um, looking ahead, 
Uh, the next EU-China summit is coming up in April. Will this issue be addressed? That's the key. You know, I understand in Brussels now they're, they're struggling to find really a good agenda because there are so many uh, frictions right now in the relationship. So will this be addressed? I think that is a key. And I think other EU member states should uh, speak not only at the EU level, but bilaterally to China. Uh, and as Nicholas pointed out in his opening remarks, one of the strengths of the EU is their, their market and that this is a real uh, test for the future of the EU. Will there be resentment at bigger EU member states? As we know, Germany is the biggest trade partner of China and they have a, a huge influence on uh, EU China policy. So with the new, in the post Merkel era, are we going to see some changes or will, will we see Merkel 2.0? This remains to be seen. So keeping my eye on the clock, I just want to note that we are seeing an autocratic advance uh, pushing the limits of uh, economic coercion and weaponized interdependence. We see this with Russia and energy in Europe. And this has kind of expressed itself in a, a weak appetite for any form of sanctions against Russia. And you know that China is watching this very carefully and looking for cracks uh, in, in the Western alliance to see where the weaknesses are and where there are possibilities to drive wedges. So to sum up, I would say Thucydides said it the best. Uh, we are entering a new era where the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I do hope that Europe can get their act together and so we're not one of the weak ones, but we actually utilize the, the strength we have. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, Frederick, um, uh, the floor is yours for your remarks. All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Nicholas, for inviting me to join you uh, for this panel this afternoon. So we, we're talking about what we can do to strengthen our economic self-defense. And of course, we talk about this in the context of uh, uh, a pretty fast acceleration over the past decade in different terms of coerc coercive actions, especially from Russia and, and China, which of course includes um, uh, violating international treaties, uh, annexing, sort of not respecting the territorial borders of other countries. Uh, not, not respecting basic principles of self-determination in, in international policies. All of this is going to increase most likely in the next 10 years, in the next 30 years, in the next 50 years. And we're going to pre be presented with a very different type of world in a couple of decades, uh, where the economic strength of especially China is going to be uh, much bigger than it is today. And where the relative economic power of both Europe and United States will be a lot smaller than it has been and also a lot smaller than it is today. So what I'm trying to think about is basically sort of how, how can we act in these circumstances under the scenarios of uh, changing patterns on economic power in the world? Uh, what can Europe do in order to uh, ensure that it's capacity of economic self-defense is going to be strong and not to let autocratic regimes to come in and dictate not just our economic policies, but also uh, uh, much more fundamental policies. I'm going to mention three things that I think are of critical importance. The first one is a pretty obvious one, which is that we need to boost our own economy. Uh, there is simply not going to be a strong Europe if we are going to accept to live in, uh, 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 in an economy which is going to generate very, very low economic growth, very, very low uh, productivity growth. Uh, economic strength comes not just from the size of the economy, but also about the power in your economy right now to shape much of the future, future patterns of production and growth, uh, not just in your own region, but in the world. And right now in Europe, we seem to be sort of accepting the idea that the future is going to be sort of, we're going to have an economy which is going to grow by say 1% a year. Um, and I think in terms of generating a lot more economic strength, we need to raise that figure quite substantially. Europe and many European countries, not all, but many are also increasingly technological laggards in the global economy. Uh, and uh, 
this is not something which is going to be compatible with the notion about using your own economic strength uh, for various international purposes. If you want to command influence in the world and have real power, you will also need to be close to the frontier of technological change. And if Europe is going to be an economy which is distant from the frontier in technological change, that is going to quite severely influence our ability to use our economy in order to generate different political outcomes that we think are good for us and the world. And I think this, this point is important because for the past 300 years, Europe has grown accustomed to the fact that it's been a center for the creation of new technology. Ever since the Enlightenment, there has been a broad agglomeration in the world towards Europe and towards the Atlantic, because that's where you found new knowledge, that's where you found new technology, new innovations that other countries needed to power their societies and their economies. This agglomeration now goes in a different direction. It moves towards the Pacific, which basically means that uh, Europe is trying to fight gravity in the world economy. And that means we need to invest a lot more and, and create a lot more better opportunities for technological change in our own economy. Second point is about the importance to build new strategic alliances and to strengthen existing alliances that work to our favor. I'm afraid to say that Europe is now going uh, uh, in many policy areas, especially in economic policy, in a different direction. It's creating this uh, sort of this illusion of creating strategic economic autonomy or technological sovereignty, which is just going to be totally impossible if you want to uh, be able to have frontier technologies and be able to compete globally in the world economy. We are having a concept about independence from the, from the world economy, which is generic and doesn't make a difference between partners and allies on the one hand, and uh, countries that are not our partners and allies, and on the other hand, basically countries that, that don't wish as well. And building new and empowering existing economies will of course have to center a lot on America and making sure that there is much stronger economic and policy integration between Europe and the United States. It doesn't stop with the United States. It's not just the transatlantic issue, but that's where it has to start. And that has to build the foundation block for uh, the ability of Europe and the United States to build something which is going to improve our capacity to withstand uh, much more coercive actions from China, Russia, and perhaps a few others in the future. Last point is on economic deterrence and uh, our uh, growing need to lay down a couple of fundamental rules for engagement when it comes to the economy and what other countries can do and not do in order, um, in order to... Um, uh, basically uh, follow uh, a vision or a practice of world economic behavior that stands in compliance sort of with the norms that have powered the economy for the past 50, 60 years. I think moving to a structure of deterrence is going to be in the first place necessary uh, for keeping our economy open more generally. I simply don't believe it's politically possible to sort of maintain sort of a high degree of openness between uh, Europe and countries like Russia and China, for instance, uh, and think that this is going to be accepted in the long term. I think uh, in the absence of a much more uh, thought through and developed deterrence mechanism, we're going gradually to move towards a position where we're going to close our economy simply because the the moral costs of 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 uh, uh, of, of the sort of behavior that we're going to see in future is simply going to be too big. I think a deterrent strategy will have to be based on the fact that we need to cut strategic dependencies on Russia and China. Um, it doesn't mean closing trade or closing investments entirely, but cutting dependencies on, 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 on these economies. And I think it's not difficult to try to figure out what that means, for instance, for energy policy or for uh, for instance, technological integrations with China. But I also think that we need to go further beyond that and, and have what I've proposed earlier to be sort of a, a sort of an economic tripwire, um, which is 
a, a, col a collaboration between Europe, United States and other countries about what type of rules for international engagement, what, what type of treaties, the core treaties and, and the principles we have around territorial integrity, how these cannot be violated. And if they are violated, they're going to lead immediately to a very strong reaction, not just from one country, but from a group of countries. Um, so finally, I'm going to end on that point on the need of, of trying to establish a mechanism which is resembling sort of an economic tripwire of the kind uh, similar to the nuclear tripwire that we developed during the Cold War. Um, and I think this is uh, um, necessary to avoid that um, the type of world is, that is emerging is going to lead us all to try to close the economies towards each other. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, the discussion there on sort of an e economic tripwire and, and also how to not to cut trade. Uh, this is not about sort of full isolation, but also how to strengthen our own national economies and regional economies with our friends and allies is, is very important, something we need to get back to. Uh, now, Dr. Ferenczi, uh, the floor is yours. We have yes, Susha, there we you. go. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm here. I'm going to share my screen because I have a few slides I would like to make avail available. So, here we are. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, first of all, for uh, putting this important panel, or at least uh, this panel for an important issue uh, together. Very happy to be uh, part of it. And I really already uh, have learned a lot uh, from listening to uh, the presentations. And I'm also very glad that I follow Frederick because some of the points I'm making actually will complement in particular, some of the points you've raised. So uh, mindful of time, I'm just is the question that we're facing today, how to build a resilient and competitive EU, which is more the self-defense aspect. And I think that we need to be, think bigger and we need to also think about the EU's ability to defend its interests and also leverage its economic power for strategic and so the main argument I'm making here is that the EU can't play defense only. It needs a comprehensive approach to address, address both the economic and the political threats it faces from authoritarian uh, governments, because I believe that uh, using economic coercion and disinformation campaigns are two sides of the same coin that China and Russia are using to undermine democracy. So I think it's always very useful to look at the context. Uh, we live in this new geoeconomic, geopolitical reality where economic inter interdependence has created power, but also a lot of vulnerabilities, in also the case of the EU. COVID-19, which was facilitated by connectivity, it has aggravated already existing tensions and countries such as China are weaponizing trade and spreading this information to undermine democracy. So I will be using these two tools when I talk about uh, tools to undermine democracy and through uh, economic means um, together, because I think they are used in a mutually reinforcing way. So the question for the EU is how can it um, strengthen its capacity to use economic power for strategic ends? And I think a very a uh, relevant angle to look at this is from the angle of the Indo-Pacific, because not only is the Indo-Pacific a key driving force of trade-led growth, but it's also the region where China's coercion has been the most acute. So we've seen that against uh, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and Taiwan, of course, for many years. So there is already um, mentioned gray zone uh, coercion. So I think it's uh, I, I just will pause for a few seconds here on what we mean really by coercion with Chinese characteristics that we've seen in particular in the case of Lithuania is using informal, hard to detect and difficult to connect to the state kind of economic tools for political pressure. And in the case of Lithuania, of course, it, it is unprecedented that Beijing went beyond Lithuanian companies to target European companies and thus 
interfere with intra-European trade. And this was supported by this information. Um, the language coming out of Beijing was that Lithuania's decision to expand ties with uh, Taiwan was in violation of uh, Be the, the, the sovereignty of the PRC, um, using the language saying that Vilnius must correct its mistakes. And uh, entirely, if we look at, um, in particular, since COVID, I think these efforts of spreading disinformation and using influence operations have, have really increased and Beijing's entire narrative on Taiwan is based on this information. So this is a critical moment for the EU. I think we all agree there. So the challenges quickly, I believe, uh, are the EU's fragmentation, uh, the challenges to moving forward in a coherent way, I mean. So there are different economic philosophies in the member states and also divergent national interests. And this has been, skillfully exploited by China. Uh, and in addition to this given, because the fragmentation is, is um, a structural constraint, but there's also lack of political will to use member states' collective economic power strategically to promote both values and interests. And there's also a lack of common strategic vision. And I think this third challenge is, is sort of like a result of the, the, of the first two, um, lack of, of, of common strategic vision. And I think connectivity is um, the, the key word that I, I will be highlighting in the, in the following slides too, as a, a key pillar uh, uh, and a tool how of a way to use economic power for strategic purposes. So the prospects looking forward, as I was saying, the EU needs a comprehensive toolbox, but also a comprehensive approach. In terms of toolbox, um, there have been uh, incre an increasing number of policy initiatives coming out of the Commission with the support or the, uh, the initiative of member states that has grown to into EU level measures in 5G toolbox or um, strengthening connectivity or the investment screening mechanism. And we now see an anti-coercion instrument being uh, worked on, uh, but I would like to um, focus on the approach here. So I argue that the EU needs to build both domestic strength and strengthen its external power projection. I mentioned one of the, uh, the challenges that the EU faces in going forward is the EU's own fragmentation. So I think in order to manage that fragmentation, uh, tools that help um, bring member states closer together when it comes to China are those tools that are most effective. So in my view, agreeing in 2019 in a European Commission communication that China is at the same time, a systemic rival, a competitor, a negotiating partner um, in different policy areas. I think this kind of multidimensional approach, uh, while it might not be uh, to everyone's liking in the European uh, Union or um, in member states, but I think this, is, this kind of approach helps um, bring member states together and agree on ways to go forward concerning China. The same, um, I would say, in terms of the, uh, having a common interinstitutional agenda, we saw, I think, in the post-pandemic recovery period that there were more initiatives uh, taken with the support of all member states. Uh, and uh, Theresa already spoke at length uh, about uh, Taiwan, and I think in also it, Taiwan and Lithuania, I mean, uh, showing solidarity uh, most recently in the communication out of Marseille also is a way of, uh, is, is an indication that there is a, a shift that we're seeing and the sort of approach to go forward with such a shift is if, if there are uh, tools that allow member states to get closer together. And for this, I think going forward, what is very important is to have an inclusive approach. As we know, 16 plus one or 17, 16 plus one was um, also possible because members, member states in Central Eastern Europe often felt that they were not uh, at the table when decisions and policies vis-a-vis -vis China are, are shaped at the European level. So I think all member states need to be part of this conversation. 
So building domestic strength and strengthening external influence. So these are the two final um, points I would like to make. Um, investing in critical technologies, addressing strategic interdependencies is where the EU needs to pay more attention to. So as a tool to go in that direction, even though we are at the very beginning of, of this road, is this, uh, in terms of strengthening it, is the European CHIPS Act um, to strengthen tech sovereignty, but also, as I said, at the same time countering disinformation that comes from China. So having, again, just like I mentioned the previous communication, we in, in uh, 2020, we saw the communication come out of uh, um, the commission um, naming China for the first time as a source of disinformation. Um, I think these initiatives taken on an EU level uh, communicate a common position. I, I am very aware that this is a communication uh, only, but I think this is part of the process. So this is what helps shape that common uh, strategic vision. And going back to the connectivity and geoeconomic binding through trade, I think the global gateway and the Indo-Pacific strategies are again, uh, tools that allow the EU to increase its global engagement, but also these um, strategies are possible because there is a convergence between member states' interests in security and economic fields. And so this is the reason why I believe that member states' convergence is, I mean, it, it is work in progress, but if we want to see a European Union that is more able to uh, its, um, its itself from economic coercion, I think uh, these elements are all very important in the process. So I will stop here. And thank you. So thank you very much. Um, uh, always interesting to, to, to listen into this. And I, I think this is very sort of practical and, and sort of as many others have done to, to look at the, the challenges that you're standing in front of. But um, without much further ado, Roland Freudenstein, the floor is yours. Thanks, Niklas. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, and I'm in the, in the proverbial situation of the famous Bavarian comedian who once started um, his show by saying everything has already been said, but not by everybody yet. So, and what is aggravating this dilemma is that I agree with what's been said, you know, so what can I still contribute here? Well, maybe to uh, put some specific accents on, on points that seem really crucial to me. Um, first of all, this, the, the, the global context in which uh, Chinese coercion uh, against uh, the whole single market, in fact, uh, not only Lithuania, is taking place. And that is one of liberal democracy versus authoritarianism. And I think that's the, the overarching confrontation which is shaping our decade and possibly other decades in the future. Um, you know, Anne Applebaum has written this totally brilliant essay before Christmas, um, the bad guys are winning in, in uh, I think in the Atlantic it was, uh, uh, where, she, where she describes this autocracy incorporated. And, um, you know, these are regimes that have a very, very, uh, smartly uh, drawn the lessons of uh, the collapse of communism and the color revolutions in the 2000s and um, the Arab Spring. And they have developed survival techniques to which we don't have an answer yet because these survival techniques uh, include attacks on liberal democracy. Um, you know, in a way, uh, our democracies are an existential threat to the Chinese Communist Party or to the Kremlin because of our existence. It's not, you know, as, as George W. Bush said after the 9-11 attacks, I mean, they hate us not for what we do, but for what we are. And, and this, is, this is, in a way, in a nutshell, the, the, the situation, which is why I believe that we're for a long time in a strategic zero-sum situation here. Uh, at least when faced with the naked aggression that we're that we're witnessing uh, uh, from Russia these days. Now, um, uh, let me uh, maybe uh, skip the 
uh, concrete the description of the of the situation in uh, uh, in uh, between Lithuania and China, because that's uh, I guess the the uh, the domain of the vice minister uh, after me. But um, rather uh, talk a little bit about the moves towards a response by the European Union uh, in the last couple of months here, and um, indeed as. Uh, my colleagues have emphasized already um, there was some uh, some unjustified uh, in in my view criticism of uh, Lithuania's uh, 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 way of acting um, but there has also been and this needs to be emphasized and this uh, you know this is where I think the glass is rather half full than half empty there has been a remarkable um, uh, demonstration of solidarity with Lithuania uh, in, in, in the European institutions and in the wider European debate. Uh, and is, especially there has been the clear recognition that this is really about uh, all of us. This is about the core of the European integration process, the single market. Um, and if we, if we give in uh, to China and let this pass, uh, uh, we are uh, seriously destroying um, not just our values, but even uh, our interests. And I think that values and interests are the same in the long term anyway, but that's a different debate. So uh, the, the instruments discussed, indeed also this has been, has been mentioned by Zhuja and others, um, the first and foremost are the so-called uh, anti-coercion instrument, uh, which means deterrence, which means the, the threat of counteractions against a case of economic coercion, which would be established by the European Commission. And this is something that hasn't been mentioned yet, where, you know, if, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the complex interplay of the institutions and member states in, in the European Union, uh, this would indeed be a sensational change uh, if the European Commission, being a supranational uh, uh, institution, were to, first of all, state that this is a case of economic coercion, and then second, define the uh, countermeasures, uh, you know, whether it's uh, the closures of certain sectors of the market or uh, 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 whatever kind of uh, 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 countermeasures one can imagine. Uh, and my prediction is that we may indeed, because of what happened to Lithuania and, and companies working with Lithuania, uh, we may see an acceleration of this uh, the, the decision making on the ACI, the anti coercion instrument. Uh, as far as I heard recently, the ambition. Uh, of both the French and the Czech council presidencies combined, meaning the French one in the first half of this year, uh, the Czech one in the second half, to until the end of this year have this instrument in place. Now, my prediction is uh, uh, we will still see some kind of um, uh, droit de regard, as they say in French, uh, some kind of co-decision co a possibility for the member states to not have the commission alone decide whether this is a case for uh, applying the uh, the anti-coercion instrument uh, and the definition of the countermeasures. So my prediction uh, is that, and, and of course, with this goes the risk that uh, uh, that the EU might not react appropriately to the really, really important conflicts, simply because some of the, the big monkeys, to use Teresa's uh, animal uh, parallels here, animal metaphors, um, because the big monkeys are afraid to engage even bigger monsters uh, out there uh, in the world. That is a risk, and, and that risk would be diminished if the Commission alone decided, but uh, it would even be there in that case. Um, but what is important to emphasize here and Zhuja has done this already, so I just have to repeat that point. The, the, the anti-coercion instrument would only be, or is only one part of the EU toolbox to deal with economic coercion. Um, and, and there is uh, the, the investment screening mechanism, uh, which needs to be mentioned here. There's the 5G strategy, um, and uh, uh, there certainly is also um, 
the global gateway strategy that, that was already mentioned. All these are uh, uh, measures to cope with the kind of economic coercion that we're uh, facing and we're going to face even more in the future. So, I mean, it, and indeed the uh, uh, bringing the case to the World Trade Organization is, is was a good thing, clearly, and it was to some people unexpected, actually, that it happened so quickly. But it may be a long and tedious case, and uh, there are numerous ways where China hopes to get away without any uh, consequences from the WTO here. Uh, but I mean, even that needs to be seen in the context of the toolbox uh, that the EU has. And yet, I think there is, uh, there is no, no guarantee that uh, the EU will successfully push back against uh, uh, against Chinese pressure in this case, uh, it takes a lot of political will and even the ability to sustain some economic pain uh, for us to do to actually develop and use the tools to resist this coercion, this authoritarian coercion. And and I want to make uh, a two two last points. Uh, one, of course, is the absolute necessity to bring up sensitive and uh, uh, for China embarrassing issues in EU-China summits. Absolutely necessary. Unfortunately, again, the big monkey has, has not performed very well last month when Olaf Scholz talked to the Chinese leadership and did not mention the Lithuanian case. Allegedly, there were two conversations. In one conversation, he mentioned it. We don't know in what sense he mentioned it. Uh, in the other one, it was definitely not in the readout. So. Um, we need to improve on this. Uh, uh, the, you know, kowtowing to China has to stop, and that goes for the EU institutions, and that goes for the, uh, the even the biggest member state. Second point to finish here: uh, the uh, the transatlantic angle. Uh, and again, this has been mentioned by colleagues, but I just want to rub it in here: the fence sitting must stop. Uh, Europe has, in its whole discourse on strategic autonomy, uh, and also as a consequence of the Trump era, of course, developed a habit of, um, well, I would say, uh, overemphasizing um, its uh, uh, alleged uh, uh, current or even more future independence from the United States. That doesn't work in defense. We all know that Europe cannot defend itself. It cannot deter uh, uh, attacks on the nuclear or conventional or hybrid level. Uh, and I think it will not work. It is not working on the level of, uh, in, in the question of trade and economic relations with powers like China. Indeed for that, China has already become way too strong. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the argument that uh, we must um, uh, prevent a new Cold War from happening, that Europe should keep some kind of equidistance between the US and China, or even mediate between the two, and the claim that while Europe's differences with China are partial uh, in, in our relationship, and more related to values, the US difference with China is just a great power rivalry, right? Is, uh, is just, uh, you know, like Athens versus Sparta uh, in, in um, ancient times. And I think that's a huge mistake uh, to, because this is always then the point of departure for saying, well, yeah, we may have some interests in common with the US, but, uh, uh, but basically our way of dealing with China will always be different. Uh, very, very dangerous emphasis. Uh, I'm not denying that there are and will be differences between the US and the, and the EU approach to China, in, in, even in economic relations. But what I'm saying is that we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we forego the option of teaming up with the United States as a democracy in trying to push back against all these phenomena that Lisa Lotta described in the beginning of an already lopsided economic relationship with China. 
So our only chance is in a, a strong transatlantic uh, a, a cooperation and coordination here. Uh, and besides that, I think the fact that the US are a democracy and, and, and Europe is built of democracies should trump all other Trump, all other uh, uh, considerations here, um, because, because uh, that is what really counts. And my very last word on this 2019 strategic outlook uh, um, definition of EU-China relations. I think this was revolutionary in its time. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've seen Chinese go live it literally about the word systemic rival. They, they could not accept that. They still cannot accept it. And yet, as Reinhard Bütikofer, member of the European Parliament, once quipped, you cannot be um, a, a cooperation partner on Monday, uh, an economic competitor on Tuesday, and a systemic rival on Wednesday. I mean, you know, I think that there is a time now, there is a moment where we have, we, we should develop a new concept. Um, and that concept at its core has to have the idea that these are not three equal, uh, uh, three equal forms of relationship, but there is a global framework, which is one of confrontation. This is a systemic confrontation. Mm -hmm. And within that framework, of course, it is possible and even necessary to cooperate on certain things, such as fighting climate change, uh, such as arms control, uh, such as uh, strengthening the World Trade Organization as far as it is still possible with China. So, I mean, so cooperation is still there, but there is a difference between the general framework in which everything happens and the individual uh, uh, measures and, and, and forms of, of interaction that happen between the EU and China. And uh, with that, I would like to give the floor back to Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you very well. Thank you very much, and I, I think it's um, one of the important, many important points is also the problem of not taking sides. I mean, as you said, fence sitting is European excel on the attempts of fence sitting, but sooner or later you're going to fall. And I, I could I could not agree more than it is important for Europe to take sides, and taking side is something I think Lithuania has done extremely well, and I think we um, should be, you know, extremely impressed by a relatively well one of Europe's smaller states, but who taking a very strong position both on China, but need, you know, even on on Ukraine and and the Russian uh, violation of Ukraine sovereignty. So, I'm extremely thrilled to have Vice Minister. Arnoldas Frankevicius, and I again apologize. Lithuanian is, um, might be is standing up for his values, but your names are very difficult to pronounce. But Vice Minister, the floor is yours, and I'm looking forward to your insights. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to this really interesting uh, debate uh, with very Good observations, very useful observations, I think, uh, for all of us. And uh, indeed, uh, thank you for your congratulations at the beginning of the webinar uh, for our Independence Day, which we indeed celebrate today, uh, remembering February 16, 1918. And I just came back an hour ago from Konas, uh, which was the capital, into war, uh, where we handed over from Vilnius to Konas, European Capital of Culture, uh, the copy of the Independence Act of 1918, which was found in Germany in the federal archives of the uh, federal MFA. And today with the German embassy, we handed it over to Konas uh, for the last year of its uh, stay here in Lithuania. And I thought to myself that, you know, freedom, which we, you know, feel very close in our hearts here in Lithuania, but across Europe today, uh, more than ever is being felt uh, uh, with uh, the whole flesh with the whole heart and with the whole mind, uh, given the uh, geopolitical situation uh, in the region and globally, and understanding how difficult it is not only to um, to fight for independence and freedom, but also to uh, to to maintain it. And in many ways, I I, I agree what Roland has said that the, the current challenges we're experiencing with China, but also with Russia, 
uh, can be seen in this um, in this um, rather uh, unfortunate uh, clash uh, of uh, of ideologies in terms of liberal democracy and authoritarianism. Uh, and in many ways, uh, both Beijing and Moscow are challenging the uh, the rules based system in their own ways. You know, Russia by taking Ukraine as hostage and uh, through massing of the troops next to the border and, and, and raising the stakes higher than ever before, trying to get the concessions from the Western community and from uh, NATO, uh, EU, um, the Western alliances uh, uh, on the security architecture of Europe uh, and on the main principles on which it is based. Uh, and of course, uh, China through uh, its uh, unannounced, undeclared measures, uh, coercive measures, uh, against Lithuania, but not only us, uh, um, is also testing the integrity of the single market and the integrity of the world trade order, uh, world trade rules. So clearly an attempt to, um, you know, shake, uh, you know, this rules-based system. And uh, it is very important that we don't, uh, you know, surrender here, and that not only we defend that system, but we strengthen it, we reform it, we make it more resilient, we make it more, um, fit for the future, not only for 55. And uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, you know, a lot has been said about our story uh, 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 with China. Um, you know, maybe I'll just add a few elements, uh, first of all, to kind of give a broader picture why perhaps uh, we have become uh, this uh, negative example that China wants to make out of us or that, uh, or that uh, chicken that uh, Theresa has uh, uh, referred to. Um, in many ways, a lot uh, is being focused on, on the Taiwanese representative office, but I would say uh, the, the issue is much larger and much bigger. Um, you know, uh, in many ways, Beijing uh, is punishing Lithuania for its overall foreign policy stance and for uh, our approach, um, uh, which uh, has been very consistent, uh, not only from the beginning of this government, but even previously. Uh, and, and some of those decisions, of course, uh, uh, first of all, are rooted in our willingness to strategically diversify our ties in Asia Pacific um, with the like-minded countries that share rule of law, share democracy uh, as important values and with, with whom we can have uh, a trustworthy and, and uh, mutually beneficial trade relations. So in the last year or so, we have expanded our diplomatic and economic ties with the uh, Australia and uh, Korea, Singapore opening the new embassies there, uh, strengthening, of course, our presence in Japan, uh, and indeed uh, uh, developing our trade ties with Taiwan. And here we have the late comers because you know uh, the 17 other EU member states have already had uh, established offices on both sides and uh, uh, have profited, benefited from trade, uh, cultural ties uh, uh, with uh, with Taiwan. Uh, we came late. Uh, but of course, uh, also with great uh, enthusiasm. Next to this strategic diversification argument and limiting our dependencies on, on one or the other big uh, supplier uh, 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 and uh, economic player, we wanted also to strengthen the European approach and so strengthen the European um, common position vis-a-vis -vis China. Hence our decision to leave OnePlus 17 uh, uh, earlier last year, uh, which was meant to uh, also inside the discussion within uh, the EU and within the remaining 16 countries, uh, whether uh, it is wise to, for us to engage in China in divisive formats or in bilateral ways, or whether it is the most effective way to engage all together as 27, as single market, as extremely powerful trading bloc, and in only this way to have an effective and equal relationship where we can uh, not only ensure fair free trade, but also uh, ensure uh, the respect for, of the values, which are very important, not only for our people, but also for our businesses, such as uh, security of our investments, uh, reciprocity of access to markets, uh, uh, intellectual property, data privacy, labor rights, and many other things that are important, not only for Lithuanian, Portuguese, Finnish companies, but I'm sure for German companies as well, even for the biggest ones. Uh, so uh, it's quite clear that either we stick together, you know, or, you know, we will not be able uh, to ensure that these principles are being uh, uh, abided by. 
And the third, of course, um, aspect which probably also uh, put us in the bad books was our willingness uh, to pay a lot of attention to the security of our strategic infrastructure uh, uh, and uh, especially you know, the 5G networks uh, when our government uh, made a decision uh, to pass a law uh, 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 in terms of allowing only EU NATO based companies to bid for the future uh, uh, networks, uh, as well as, uh, you know, our stance of not, uh, you know, allowing uh, unsecure investments uh, in the climate of the seaport, uh, which is a very important uh, um, gateway also for, for trade and transit. So in many ways, uh, it is an overall foreign policy approach, I think, which was challenged uh, through indeed uh, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, um, measures, which uh, Zuza very well uh, explained, you know, and they are unprecedented not only in uh, economic uh, terms, but also diplomatic, because it was the first time that uh, EU NATO member state uh, experienced a recalling of the ambassador, and not only recalling of the ambassador, but downgrading unilaterally our embassy in Beijing to the office of Treasury Affairs and asking our diplomats to surrender their diplomatic passes by a certain date, which forced us really, uh, you know, to bring them all back to Vilnius, uh, uh, in, in indeed also in quite an unprecedented way. Economically also, you know, we, we not only saw the classical approach of targeting uh, exports and imports of an individual country, but for the first time, the new methodology used in terms of affecting the supply chains uh, and have secondary effects uh, to the companies that either uh, have invested in Lithuania or use Lithuanian-made uh, components in their uh, 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 manufacturing, or has anything else, you know, to do with with with, with Lithuania. So this was really uh, 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 an uh, you know unprecedented type of decision to 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 hit not only us but the single market, um, and therefore, of course. Rightly so, uh, uh, it has become not just a Lithuanian issue, but an EU issue, um, and the European Union took it very seriously. And indeed, you know, many of you have talked about European solidarity and the response of the European Union. We also feel that the response indeed came very quickly. If the measures of um, China started on the 1st of December, when our products uh, you know, were not allowed uh, in the Chinese customs um, uh, uh, you know, uh, ports, uh, already one week later, on December 8th, we had a joint statement of uh, High Representative Borrell and Executive Vice President Dombrovskis clearly, uh, uh, you know, saying that this is uh, an EU uh, issue and that Lithuanian exports are EU exports and that therefore, you know, this will require European response. Uh, also, the same day, on, on uh, a request of uh, the European Union delegation in Geneva, the WTO Director General Ngozi raised the issue uh, with the Premier Li during the one plus six uh, video call of uh, main uh, international financial institutions. Um, and in just less than two months, we have submitted every day and every every hour pretty much over Christmas and New Year, uh, all, of the, all of the evidence that we have um, uh, received from the companies uh, that have experienced problems to the European Commission uh, uh, with every single shipment of product that has been impacted. And the Commission gathered enough evidence on January 27th, I would say in a record time, to start those consultations at the WTO. Um, and not only to start the consultations, uh, but uh, also uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, in many ways send a message that uh, that European Union is very serious about this issue. The consultations since then have been joined by, by all main uh, Western, uh, uh, you know, economic players. United States, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, um, UK, Japan it was also joined by Taiwan. Of course, China can uh, has a right, you know, to dismiss any of their application. Uh, China, however, has accepted the start of the consultations, and now we have 60 days of the period when we can reach an amicable solution, satisfactory solution, during which uh, you know the issue might be settled. If it is not settled then uh, you know, the European Commission would go to the panel, establishing of the panel, which might take uh, anywhere from nine months uh, or, or more, uh, uh, and, and afterwards an appeal procedure. But of course, with the appeal procedure, you know, uh, the 
uh, the applet body still being, uh, being not workable in the WTO, uh, it would need to be done uh, in uh, other courts. However, the process has started and we think it is not only a matter of principle, but it is also a very important leverage uh, on China uh, uh, or the European Union. It will be definitely a very important uh, uh, case in the trade uh, policy history. I know that already quite a few colleagues are looking into writing PhD pieces about it. And uh, hopefully, you know, it will indeed contribute to, you know, much more assertive and resilient uh, trade policy of the EU. In Marseille, I was there representing Lithuania. Uh, I was really struck by incredible unity around the, uh, around the table. And um, the French uh, trade minister, Franck Lister, really uh, was very kind to offer us a special point in the agenda to brief the ministers on the situation uh, and indeed was very uh, moving and emotional to, to, to feel uh, solidarity of all member states at the table uh, and a clear, clear uh, uh, mandate for the commission to go ahead and to continue. Uh, uh, Vice President Dombrovskis has also made a, a very thorough uh, uh, presentation of the commission steps that have been taken and will be taken in the future. So I think we are on a good track and I also visited uh, Paris yesterday and Berlin two weeks ago, also in Berlin meeting not only the new government, but also the business associations, uh, BDI and VDI, the, the main federal industry association and the automotive industry association. And indeed, uh, I, I heard uh, quite clear um, the willingness of the major German business to, uh, to continue trusting Lithuania as a safe country for investments. Uh, to, to give also complete confidence into the European track and into the Commission's work. Uh, and I was very reassured by this visit that indeed, uh, especially our very strong relations with Germany, economic relations, and Germany is number one investor in Lithuania, that they will continue. That we, they will continue and that actually we will, uh, we will support each other here uh, rather than uh, allow Beijing you know, to divide us further or indeed uh, spread uh, panic. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, you know, what are the lessons for uh, uh, the European Union? Uh, I think you know, uh, also referring to many ideas that have already been shared. First of all, clearly this is also a very good case for the EU strategic resilience um, and uh, for the strategy that is not only very much forcefully promoted by the French presidency, but by the European Union itself through the new CHIPS Act and the through DCA, DMA package in digital uh, area, through, of course, even our recovery and resilience plans, which are you know, mostly devoted to our uh, you know, green and digital transformation. We should really have to use it fully and, and to the best uh, possible way in order to invest uh, uh, in, the, in the new uh, 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 economy uh, and to strengthen not only our industrial base, but also to, to, to invest in, in, in new supply chains, what I would call democratic supply chains uh, uh, and, and limiting our dependence on some of the authoritarian regimes that, that, that pose us a risk. Secondly, of course, we need to complete the, uh, our trade toolbox. And here uh, already Roland's mentioned anti diversion instrument is uh, crucially important. And we will be and the member state that uh, will help the French uh, with, uh, with our uh, uh, also support uh, to push it through. And, uh, um, and I hope a lot of member states have the same feeling that uh, uh, you know, we need to equip ourselves as the European Union also with the tools of deterrence. Uh, these are not tools of offense, but of defense uh, in order to protect our legitimate interests and to deter any cohesive you know, actions of the third countries into the future, in the future. Here we have uh, European Parliament as a big uh, um, ally. Uh, we had uh, also a video call with the Bern Lange uh, in Marseille, you know, who's the Inter chairman and who's a rapporteur on anti-coercion instrument. And he is uh, very uh, enthusiastic about moving fast, maybe even reaching trilogues by the end of the French presidency. But we need to convince some of the maybe more reluctant member states. And I would say the most reluctant member state at the moment is Sweden. Uh, so I'm looking forward to also for bilateral consultations with my Swedish uh, partners uh, on this question. And third uh, aspect, which is very important as, 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 a, as a lesson learned is of course, strengthening transatlantic dialogue, giving 
given this positive dynamic that we have in EU US trade relationship, we have to use it. Of course, not all, not all issues are uh, solved, far from it, but we have a positive agenda. We have the new Trade and Technology Council, which uh, uh, can be a good arena, not only to coordinate our actions on, on, on digital uh, uh, area, or indeed, for instance, in the area of semiconductors, but also could be a good area to coordinate our respective instruments in terms of anti-coercion policy. So, uh, uh, Nicolas, sorry for being too long, uh, but I hope uh, this adds to the discussion, and thank you once again for, for organizing it. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the insights. And uh, well, in many ways, I think you were the most positive one of us all. <laughs> but it's good that the politicians, at least, and uh, the, the foreign service people have uh, a positive agenda. Um, I will actually start with two questions, where, one to Lisilot and one to Teresa, because they will have to leave a bit early. So. Uh, but for Lisa Lott, I mean, uh, it was, I think it was extremely interesting when uh, we talked about the, the shipbuilding industry. And I mean, you, you sort of painted a very bleak picture of, of the future. But is there anything Europe can do about the challenge from the Chinese, Chinese shipbuilding? Is there any strategy we would be able to develop? And for Teresa, I was. I was intrigued by the when you talk about the asymmetrical problems and how China manipulates it to move it from a bilateral issue into hijacking, in a sense, the Europeans by not allowing Lithuanian products to be part of the export. I mean, how do we how do we challenge this? How do we? What would be uh, an effective strategy to counter? such a behavior from the Chinese. And this lot, do you want to start? And then we move over to Teresa. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will now uh, focus more on the positive side. Uh, and indeed, I want to start by saying that one of the problems is not that Europe has not got the technological lead in many industries. Indeed, it has, where it remains competitive. Uh, that is also the case in the remaining areas of the shipbuilding uh, industry where Europe is still functioning. Indeed, there is now discussions as to whether Europe and US will cooperate on shipbuilding in the way that Europe can relearn America to build ships and revive its industry uh, by building factories that are joint. So the problems, I think, are more to do with finance, regulation, and policy. Uh, one area that's a problem is that China's enormous financial resources must be matched in order for Europe to re retain its economic health and to remain competitive. So far, the EU's competition rules have not been very helpful. Uh, maybe a lot of you have heard about the, two, uh, the 2019 case where the European Commission blocked the merger of the largest regional suppliers in the rail market, which was Alstom and Siemens, uh, and this happened despite prior French and German governmental approval because uh, the Commission believed that the merger would, would harm competitiveness. But the merger was meant to, to create a European match for China's state-owned railway corporation, which is becoming dominant in global rail markets. Uh, and you have the same problem uh, with ships. So uh, the European competition policies, policies, they need to be reconciled in a way that ensures that European companies are, efficient, uh, are sufficiently sizable to enjoy economies of scale, because that will allow them to compete with gigantic Chinese companies with access to, to enormous resources. Um, a second problem is to ensure that you win the technology race, uh, and Europe can still do that, uh, but you need to establish private-public partnerships. Um, in the area of shipbuilding, uh, Europe could try to, to develop um, a carbon-neutral vessel, which is competitive, 
China is again, they're already working on this. So the Dalian shipyard in China is already developing a carbon neutral vessel that runs on ammonia. And ammonia has, been, has attracted a lot of interest as a source of zero emission fuel for shipping. Um, green ammonia, which is produced by electrolysis is an excellent source of zero emission fuel, uh, but it requires a massive investment program to produce enough supplies and to drive down the costs of doing so, so that the fuel becomes financially viable. So Europe could instead uh, travel down the, a different route by reinventing propulsion and fuel technology to allow for the construction of carbon neutral vessels that are commercially viable. And that strategy could very well be key to long-term global leadership in the shipbuilding industry because shipping is likely to have become decarbonized by 2050. So to pave the way for Europe to take the lead in these propulsion and fuel technologies, the EU could facilitate public private sector partnerships that focuses on commercially viable in the innovation and shipbuilding. And a third thing Europe can do is to build highly automated ship factories to ensure that companies are capable of turning out large amounts of vessels in a financially viable way, not just commercial vessels, but also Navy vessels. Because if we can't produce vessels, we have to buy them in China. And that is probably not the, the direction we want to head. Uh, but volume is necessary to save the European maritime supply chain, which still exists. And this involves building dual use ship factories, which is the standard now in China and which are used to produce commercial and Navy vessels. Uh, in, for example, in 2019, uh, one of the big Chinese shipyards produced four ultra large container ships per year in addition to six air defense destroyers and three guided missile destroyers. Uh, and that's why the Chinese Navy is catching up with the United States. And it does that in five classes of warships, attack submarines, ballistic missile submarines, small surface ships, large surface ships, and aircraft carriers all of which are at the heart of the US command of the maritime domain and hence its claim to global primacy, which is also being eroded. So, I mean, this kind of, this is also an area where Europe and the US could work together uh, and ensure that, you know, we can still build Navy vessels that, that you know, comes at a price that everyone can afford. So those are my three suggestions. And I think the security component uh, in this is possibly the most important uh, because if we can't produce military vessels, we really do face an enormous uh, challenge from China, which is not just economic, but which is also a security challenge that is much bigger than it is now. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa? Okay. Uh, thank you for your question, mm. Nicholas. Uh, if they have the head of the WTO. So China is uh, weaponizing supply chains and this is a huge threat to the EU. And as the minister pointed out, it wasn't just the Taiwan office. It's like a whole list of things that have annoyed Beijing, and so they are being punished. And the, I'm glad to hear that he was in Marseille and that he, he was moved by the show of solidarity. So to me, that, that's a very promising sign. But um, rhetorical support is one thing. And you know, are they going to put their money where their mouth is? And the other issue now is that these supply chains, I mean, I've heard from some people that they can kind of fudge it a bit to kind of fudge over uh, you know, Lithuanian components in certain supply chains. But now that you have Chinese investors, uh, for example, Gili in Daimler-Benz, they can flag this and say, we know these components come from Lithuania. So you have a, a, a landscape now, an economic landscape where China has a lot of investments. And it, 
I think we've reached a, a serious tipping point where countries can't say no now to China. I'll give you uh, two examples. So one is in regard to elite capture. So China's uh, strategy in Europe, uh, United Front work, and you know, money in the 21st century in Europe really has a lot of influence. And Chinese investments do come with strings attached as we're finding out here. And so you know, I have been going, I was based in Beijing from 2003 to 2007, and I returned to Brussels then. And for the last 14 years, I've heard in conferences and closed door events, money has no color. This was what many, many think tankers were saying. And I think we've woken up. I mean, I didn't agree with that, but you know, many people thought, doesn't matter if China wants to invest, that's great. Now they've invested in over 10% of European ports from zero to 10%. I think that that has huge strategic implications. And we're just getting, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg of how they're going to weaponize their investments in Europe. And I think that this is a huge challenge. Um, but so the example I wanted to point out was about a leak capture. So we saw, for example, uh, the head of Ericsson lobby for uh, Huawei, their competitor. And we know this because of transparency laws in Europe. And we could see that he was, uh, lobbying on behalf of his competitor because they have economic interests in China and this is how the, the system works. So if you have any sort of economic ties to China, those can be used and you would actually have to lobby on China's behalf, a competitor in your own market. And the other one I want to point out is the sale of the 30% um, stake in the, the port of Hamburg in Germany. Uh, you know, intelligence officials had warned about this and it came to a point where they said, China is such a huge trade partner that we can't even say no. We cannot say no that we don't want you to invest in our port because then they could be punished. So I think we, we've really reached a tipping point where countries can't say no to China. And I don't know how uh, this can be addressed. I know you want a good, clear answer. And I, I know people are saying resilience and, and we've seen kind of a shrinking of the European economy. And I think that these things are deeply worrying. And um, as my colleague from ESIP has uh, pointed out, we need to improve at the economy. But is it, uh, you know, these are, are good uh, um, ideas. And will they be able to meet the challenge? Because I, I, my first impressions was were that there wasn't a whole lot of solidarity and support. Um, in addition to that, we're seeing a double, you know, double headed uh, threat here with the PRC, Russia, Entente. Yeah, and with the opening of the Olympics, uh, we saw the, the 5,000 word document between Russia and China. And I think this is extremely significant and we should pay a lot of attention to that. And I, I suggest everyone to uh, read that uh, because this is kind of mapping out how they see the new world order. But I, I would add rhetorical support is not enough. Uh, we've saw, you know, in the early days, the US gave a 600 million uh, credit line to Lithuania to help uh, help them over the, the initial shock of what was going on. And uh, just to pick up on another point that uh, Roland made about democracy and Anne Applebaum's article, uh, Tim Snyder, a Yale historian, mentioned in a recent piece that democracy is so desirable and such a, a good that even authoritarian regimes are calling themselves a democracy. China, I was on a panel recently with the Chinese diplomat and he was saying, no, no, our democracy is better than the West democracy because we are so good at um, meeting our, our, our uh, public's needs. We know what they want before they pretty much even know it themselves through our surveillance cameras and, and constant um, uh, watching of the system. So democracy is a desirable and even authoritarian regimes will repurpose it. So they, they're trying to head off this narrative of authoritarians versus democracies as Roland is trying to frame it. And we've seen a lot of lobbying by Chinese officials to remove the systemic rival language from the EU. And we know once the EU agrees to something, that's not going to be taken out. So this, you know, this kind of multifaceted three basket approach towards China is here to stay. And I, I do agree with um, Roland that perhaps it is better to update it. I think that's it's not working because China sees it as one big uh, position, a, a complete garment, not in separate three baskets. And um, I, I think we really are seeing a huge challenge here. We've been sleepwalking into this mire for quite some time. I'm sorry if I'm not 
very optimistic. And I, I really think that uh, the EU is going to have to pull really hard to get all member states in agreement and support. And this is, as uh, Reinhard Butekofer has noted, this is a holy grail of the EU trade policy. And if they cannot protect member states from Chinese economic coercion, we're really in uh, uncharted territory for the future of the EU. So it really is almost an existential challenge. And so I would add that um, the minister mentioned, uh, you know, we have a, a lovely toolbox and all of this, but will there be a will to actually use these things. And we know the FDI screening mechanism, it sounds good, but in reality, 15 EU member states still don't even have a national FDI screening mechanism. So I think that the anti-coercion instrument, it is getting further impetus and that is promising, but will there be an ability for the other EU member states to kind of water it down? So this remains to be seen. We've seen the initial document, it's being debated now. And I really do hope that uh, they really try to come up with something strong, not, you know, the 27 EU member states all in agreement uh, at a very low level watered down document, because I think it, the situation is very uh, significant. And this idea, I mean, I've seen this debate go on and on about decoupling. Um, China has been decoupling from the West for several years now. And because we should look at what they're doing because that's what they're going to kind of prepare for for us in the transatlantic space. And so I think that China's efforts to decouple earlier, this kind of strict, it's impossible. No one can decouple from China, but there needs to be strategic decoupling in, in very important areas. And, you know, the economic outlook in Europe, it's, it's, it's not as positive as we would like it to be. We're seeing a lot of rhetoric, a lot of efforts. But I think that uh, either uh, the future has to have, okay, I'll, I'll try to end on a positive note. The trade, the TTC, the Tech and Trade Council is a promising uh, event or possibility to coordinate more closely in the transatlantic space. And of course, as previous speakers have mentioned with um, the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, you need to diversify your partners. And that is also a very, key area to help grow the economy. But I think that because of China's uh, it already established um, investments, many people even think that the FTI screening mechanism, China can act through proxies. And so it's very difficult to screen what they are actually doing. So I think that uh, strategic vigilance coupled with strategic um, decoupling is required. And I really do hope that there will be political will to see this implemented. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna let Roland in, yes. Um, I see your your little hand popping up there, but what intrigues me is when you say, well, I mean, basically what you're asking is, can European Union say no? And that reminds me of the old book, the China that can say no, which was a big thing that came out. and. And I agree with you, China has done this deliberately for a long time to decrease uh, dependency and critical dependency. And I, I, my question of course is, I mean, it's not a question if Europe can say no, it's a question, can we afford not to? And I think that, and this is a question I would like to pose to all the, the, the speakers is this, you know, what can we do and how should we do it? Because I'm of the very strong opinion we, we need to decrease critical dependency. I mean, I'm happy to let the Chinese produce t-shirts, but I may, might not appreciate microchips that we need or naval vessels. That, I mean, there's, there's a, a difference between trading and trading in critical industry. But so I would be very interested in, in listening into what people have. But Roland, I will let you have the floor now. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, and uh, let me let me come back to Teresa. Teresa, great great attempt at being a little bit optimistic, but <laughs> nope, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> Was not convincing. <laughs> no, but look, this brings me to a larger point. Um, in the in the Russia debate, as well as in the China debate, as well as in the overall debate about authoritarianism versus democracy. Where there are two uh, general risks, 
and, and, and these risks are at the two extremes of the debate spectrum. One risk is defeatism, and the other risk is complacency. Um, so, I mean, you know, to, to say that uh, China has won the game, it's too late, guys, you know, they rule the world, nothing we can do. Sorry, that won't cut it. First of all, it's not true. Um, a, a second, there is, um, there, are, there are very good reasons to think why China is going to have some real long-term problems of its own making. Um, you know, starting from demographics to uh, the pollution to um, uh, the, 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 the petrification of decision making in Beijing, which is now beginning in the political sphere with the Chinese Communist Party. And it will also, it, it, it might very well uh, extend to, to, to business decision making and so on. Um, but, but of course, the other, the other risk is, is complacency. I mean, especially with Russia, I admit, is, is the complacency with China is, is not so much en vogue. But what, what I'm trying to say is that if, if we want to develop pushback, we better not uh, lose hope to, at the very beginning of the process, because then uh, we, can, we, can, we, we can send our kids to... Uh, to Chinese schools already, you know, I mean, why not, why not uh, resign to our fate um, and make the best of it materially? No. Um, and, and this is my last point here. Uh, look at the trajectory of the European debate on China. Look at where we were five years ago, uh, 2017. I mean, China was celebrated as our, our big ticket to the 21st century, our ticket to a profitable safe, uh, uh, a technologically advanced future. And look at where the debate has, has ended up right now. Um, and a very good example is the German Federation of Industries, you know, which by the way, preceded the European Commission by two months in 2019 in actually naming China as a threat to liberal democracy. I mean, in a way, they went in, in some parts of their strategy paper of January 2019, they went far beyond what the commission ever did um, in terms of defining China uh, as an antagonist. And this was the German Federation of Industries, right? Including car makers, by the way. Um, and the, also public opinion has vastly changed. Uh, the European Union, uh, you, you, you could see during the pandemic, especially in the first half year of, of, of the corona pandemic, how public opinion turned vastly into the negative in most member states of the European Union and neighboring countries. I mean, a couple of exceptions like Serbia, notwithstanding, um, I mean, even in Italy, which was initially very, very uh, positive in its public opinion. Uh, it turned towards the negative. Now you can say that this is, yeah, well, where's the action? Where's the beef? Sure. Um, but I mean, first you got to change the rhetoric and the, and, and the narrative and the discourse, and then you can change the policies. And I must say the glass is at least half full when it comes to uh, our pushback against Chinese coercion. We're not there yet. But uh, I mean, to say that uh, we'll never make it, uh, I think is the wrong approach. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just make one quick comment? Yeah. You know, I didn't want to paint such a bleak picture, but the reason I want to emphasize that it is a huge challenge and that we must work together to face it. It's not you know, a little peripheral issue on the sidelines. It is a huge uh, challenge. And I think it's, it's been you know, a red rhino running towards us for you know several years now and I think there has been division across Europe um, and this has created the fragmented approach and this has been playing into to Beijing's hands so as we all know the EU has to speak with one voice and it's difficult and it's challenging but that's the only way to, to make this happen and I agree with you I with you Roland on this I I, I I do apologize if I painted a more negative picture, but I, I'm doing that to give it rocket fuel to emphasize how serious a challenge this is. China is showing us their hand. We should pay attention. You know, it's not a small threat. It is a massive threat. Thanks. Susha and then uh, Fredrik. Yes, thank you. Um, what so much has been said, so I'm trying to, um, I was taking 
notes to see what I can comment on, but I would like to pick on your question, Theresa, on how do we say no to China? And clearly, I mean, we all know that this is not a new question. It's just that we've been in a more comfortable situation to just go ahead with business as usual for all these years until Midea acquired KUKA uh, and until we realized that Chinese state-owned enterprises are increasingly buying off uh, high and valuable strategic uh, industry and new technology in Europe and Chinese um, Costco owns uh, what I think 10% of uh, European ports in terms of capacity. So I think uh, at this stage and also mindful of and like consciously wanting to be more uh, optimistic is that I think at this stage after what we've seen unfold with the pandemic and China's aggressive behavior uh, in the past two years that was seen through disinformation and also economic coercion, I think there is no turning back. So no matter what happens, even if member states will not agree to go forward together in, a, in, in the way that we would like them to go forward together, I think there is no turning back. So that gives me hope that the language that we see come out of Brussels is unprecedented. And I also say that first comes the language because that creates space for the debate we need to have seriously on our strategic dependencies. And I am very aware of uh, the fact that having beautiful tools is only effective if, um, if we can put it in practice. And I believe that uh, the, the European am grand ambition uh, in terms of semiconductors capacity uh, and tech sovereignty, and also the global gateway, these are long-term solutions. And these can only help Europe in the long term because reducing our inter interdependence is not going to happen overnight. Of course, it's a long-term investment. But I think having these tools and also working on an anti-coercion tool is in itself sending a message. Of course, we want tools that are effective, but I strongly believe that speaking and uh, using the language that the European Commission used to say that we will not, um, we will push back against coercion as a result of China's coercion. And, yeah, and there was a common message coming out of Brussels. I think all of this is taking us into that direction. Of course, I am realistic that member states will remain in the driving seat. But what makes me optimistic is that there's no turning back. And also, um, that's why short term, I think fighting against disinformation to shed light on the threats that come to undermine democracy from an authoritarian uh, China is so important. And that's more short, that's an immediate thing that we are doing or we should be doing. And I think that is why the European Parliament's delegation to Taiwan um, to work together in our fight against disinformation is also extremely valuable. And that is because I think all member states have um, experienced the, the threat of disinformation. So I think it's wise for European member states to try to work together in a field that is not so sensitive, right? Because disinformation is a threat to all member states. And Taiwan and embracing Taiwan, even though we see this shift in the narrative uh, remains and will remain um, work in progress, but finding ways that brings uh, member states together, such as this information is, is I think very smart and strategic, uh, speaking of the need to be working together strategically. And also uh, the last point in terms of the economic loss that Lithuania is uh, facing as a result of China's co economic coercion, I think here we see solidarity is important, but we also see calls for financial help to offset those losses. But we also see Taiwan commit to invest in Lithuania. So we saw the 200, uh, that 200,000, no, 200 million, sorry. 
uh, investment into uh, Lithuania and also the 1 billion credit fund that would help cooperation between Lithuania and Taiwanese companies such as in joint ventures and so forth. So I think this is uh, almost, I am comfortable to say sitting here in Taiwan that this is a joint responsibility of Taiwan and Lithuania. And I think that Lithuania's, I, really this is my last point, you know, the question coming from other member states that Lithuania did not consult them in how they are going forward, you know, someone who comes from Central Eastern Europe, I have my, my doubts about, um, you know, bigger member states criticizing uh, Central Eastern European countries for not consulting them on how they go forward with China or Taiwan. I think there needs to be a little more nuance there. Uh, and I guess I don't need to explain. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to come back to other points, thanks. Eric? Thank you. Um, and a couple of points I'd like to make, um, um, and I think, um, I mean, many of them has already been made, but I think some of them are sort of, it's, it's important to understand the significance and what they entail in terms of policy choices that we are confronted with. I think the point that Roland made about the overall direction, both of Europe and of China, I think it's, it's absolutely correct. I think we're making a mistake in thinking that we can just extrapolate um, China's how, how high growth rates in the past into the future and, and imagine sort of that by 2050, it's going to be um, sort of an extrapolation from where we are right now. There are huge uh, structural changes happening in the Chinese economy uh, with clearly receding effects on economic growth, um, with um, an exhaustion of different growth models that have been applied in the past, um, an industrial policy which has basically ran into the wall where it's very difficult to achieve something um, in terms of future growth through industrial policy um, uh, in the same fashion at, as they could do it during the noughties. Um, and we are talking about um, a Chinese development with um, significantly smaller growth rates in the future compared to its past. But that's probably also one of the reasons to expect that um, uh, China's inward looking behavior is going to become even stronger, that its protection of its own markets is going to become stronger, that its aggressions towards other countries probably will become stronger too, because um, countries that are going through structural growth uh, decelerations don't tend to be the type of economies that are um, open and have soft elbows vis-a-vis -vis other countries. They rather tend to be countries that are trying to sharpen conflict that they have with other, con with other countries. I think it's also important to recognize that Europe has made a pretty significant change over the past five years. I mean, you and I, Nicholas, we've talked about this in the past, that there is a very, very different tone in, in, in Europe's China policy today compared with just a few years ago. My problem is that um, when uh, these observations about developments in the future are being turned into policy choices in Europe, we are not making the right choices. Um, one of the fault lines is uh, the one I mentioned initially in the sense that a lot of the tools that we are developing right now, including the anti-coercion initiative, don't make a difference between a friend and an enemy, between a partner or an ally and a rival. These are policies with generic orientations and where Brussels and in member states imagine they are going to be used, some of our partners and allies, including the United States. Um, this is a tool which has in, been in the making for a long time and the target when this has been discussed in the past has always been United States and United States sanctions programs. Uh, and this is what we've seen also with um, some of the Brussels reactions and some of, with some of the member states reactions that have been coming, for instance, over Iran and, and new sanctions there with different attempts to circumvent them and seek a policy diversion with the United States. 
another problem is that we think that uh, a greater use of industrial policy in Europe is going to uh, uh, change the conditions for our relative uh, economic power and that it's going to enable us to become a lot more competitive in the future. I don't think that is true. I, I don't think we even remotely are talking about the resources uh, that would be necessary in order for industrial policy to make an impact on the overall competitive direction of the European economy. Uh, I think we're talking about much more fundamental problems in the European economy that will have to change if we're going to be able to have uh, a stronger capacity to compete in global markets, because that's really what the question is mostly about. It's not so much about Chinese uh, goods um, overwashing um, Europe in, in many, many different sectors. If you go through and look at sort of the strategic vulnerabilities that we have in trade and investments in our imports from China, um, sort of the top products are going to be ginseng, bamboo. Um, there's going to be a few rare earths which are important, but they um, have problems partly because it's impossible to get um, uh, environmental approvers, approvals to um, mine these earths in Europe. Um, countries outside China that we can trade with are countries that we are seeking policy uh, confrontations with over other issues. So that makes it difficult too. But the point is that um, the strategic dependency on China is not that very strong. It's much more of a problem that we can't compete on fair terms in third markets. Uh, for instance, in the shipbuilding industry, uh, and I think that's a classic case where when you look at European shipbuilding and when you look at European imports of, of ships, European trading ships more generally, it's um, especially in the military field, it's, it's of course an area where we are desperately trying to look around for new customers in the world to buy the, uh, the, uh, the different vessels or the submarines that are being built in Europe. Uh, and it's problems um, uh, around ownership and our ability to create sort of a properly functioning European market here. Uh, Can I make a, a short intervention because I have to go about shipbuilding. Um, we are competitive in many ships still, uh, and we are able to produce vessels uh, uh, that are sufficiently cheap that we can sell them. So, uh, like I said, there is hope for it, but it requires that you're allowed to, to build factories, build economies of scale. So at least in that industry, it is not true. And there is things to be done. Uh, if, if mergers, if, if, if economies of scale are allowed to be, uh, yeah, to be had in Europe, and if we work with the Americans, uh, as you yourself pointed out. So. Yeah, I mean, my, my point would be sort of the problems here is are not that competition law stands in the way of mergers and acquisitions in Europe. The problem is that uh, in most of the shipyards we have, there are strategic interests of the host government to avoid that we have larger mergers. I mean, there's been so many shipbuilding mergers that have been talked over the past 15 years and they've not happened. Why? Well, it's because the German government, the French government, the Italian government, the Greek government, the Swedish government are saying no to them because they want to keep them on their own. So the problem here is not sort of an Alstom seamen situation where we would create sort of monopolies in nine, 10 European countries if we allowed a merger like that. This is much more about problems of scale being generated because member state governments want to keep control over their own uh, uh, shipbuilding producers. They will, to my best, the best of my knowledge, there are mergers that would be made and these are talked about as well, but they may you know, happen outside of Europe because of, because of the rules. Anyway, yeah, but it's sort of you know uh, naval group um, think Antieri. Uh, they are getting closer to each other. No one says that. No, there. Um, uh, Tissenkrupp Marine Systems have been trying to sell off the, to others, but the German government is saying no. They would like to have a merger in inside Germany with German Naval Yard and with Lursen instead, and and that's the development we're seeing. Anyway, my point here is is sort of a simple one, which is that there are a lot of things that we can do in Europe where we control our policies, 
to achieve a lot more competitiveness and a lot more scale uh, in, in, in our own production. And this is not sort of classic industrial policy where we're going to sprinkle a lot of cash on industries. This is much more about improving the rules to avoid that we can compete a lot better. Final point there, which is similar to the semiconductor story. Um, Europe is representing 5% of the global uh, market of uh, uh, semiconductor consumption. Uh, that is not going to change. The relative market shares are not going to change very much. Um, we are not uh, dependent on China in, in semiconductors, nor is the United States. We're dependent on Taiwan and we're dependent on, on, on the United States. And when we try to go ahead with different uh, industrial policies that uh, is going to generate much more output of semiconductors in Europe. The risk, of course, is that we're going to create strategic competition between the United States and us and between us and, and Taiwan. And I don't think that's what we want to achieve when we would like to use strategic economic policies in order to improve the conditions uh, for ourselves and the world. So my point, my point is basically this. Um, we can we can develop a lot of these defensive tools that are being discussed. Um, very few of them are going to have much of a bite unless we can also generate a lot better conditions for European producers to compete and be competitive on global markets, because that is where the main problems are. It's not necessarily in Europe, it's on global markets. Thank you. So, well, th <clears throat> thank you very much. I mean, we're quickly approaching deadline and I would like to also let the vice minister maybe say something. We actually have two questions on there and one is, Marianne Lanza, who is uh, talking about the Belt and Road Initiative and, uh, and the giant uh, port project in Morocco and uh, in under the plan in Algeria. There's also 90,000 Chinese in Algeria and she wants to know a bit on, you know, how you view this as part of the Chinese strategy. And then Sufe asks if we don't like to see China to change its behavior. I think I can answer. We do like to see China change its behavior, but the question, of course, is how do we make them change their behavior? <laughs> but um, so I, I apologize there, but um, I think the uh, discussion took a you know, very interesting turn anyway. But uh, Vice Minister, do you want to wrap things up? And then we will unfortunately have to call it a day today. Thank you, Nicholas. Well, ju just a few sentences. You know, listening to a really good exchange, I think uh, uh, we, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, real problems being identified and real uh, uh, vulnerabilities of, of the European Union. But I think also what is important to state that often we're known in the world for being sometimes too self-critical and lacking confidence. And I think that's one of the biggest problems indeed with, with us as Europeans is uh, not believing in our strength. Uh, I believe we have an incredible strength, incredible potential in all of those fields, uh, if we only want to achieve it. Uh, we have uh, a very talented uh, pool of, 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 of people. Uh, we have, uh, you know, incredible story and history of, uh, of collective power, of working together. We have extremely strong single market that we want to preserve. And I think that uh, uh, we have all of the elements for the European Union to be very successful player in the 21st century, um, and indeed uh, uh, willing to have good relations with everyone, including with China. Uh, 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 but I think that relationship can only happen if we are ourselves self-confident, uh, if we are treated as one, I mean, especially in economic and trade terms, and, and if we manage, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, to save uh, the most important values uh, without which we would not be able to have uh, uh, this uh, promise of Europe, and that is rule of law, democracy, and human rights. So, so you know, my my wish from Vilnius today, which is celebrating Independence Day, you know, let's look uh, to the future with with confidence. Uh, and uh, if we will not ourselves let others divide us, nobody will indeed succeed to do so. Well, thank you very much. And um, I, I think it's it's good to end on a, on a positive note. And as I said, you're, you seem to be the most positive <laughs> of all of us. But uh, that said, I think it is important. Um, 
and as uh, said before many times there is that uh, if Europe actually commits to this and, and develops its own strategy and takes this seriously, I think the glass is more than half full. I mean, we have the capacity, we have um, we have the toolbox. The question is just, do we allow ourselves to use it? So I I do remain a bit optimistic. But well, congratulations on your national day um, to all out there. I would say buy yourself a Lithuanian beer to support the local economy, uh, and. Um, have a wonderful day and I do encourage you all to look at the publication that will come out after, after this. I think that would be a ex very interesting publication that will summarize a bit of our ideas. So thank you very, very much. And uh, let's be in touch. Cheers. Bye-bye. Niklas, I, I, just, oh, yes. I just wanted to, yeah, I wanted to just add not miss this opportunity since I'm in Taipei that the first time I had a Lithuanian chocolate was in Taiwan. So I think that's a very positive note to, uh, and also to congratulate uh, what Taiwan and Lithuania are doing. You know, I am here and I observe how positively it is received, but how much more work there needs to be done. But I really wanted to add this and I'm sorry I took the, the floor from you, Nicholas. No, 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 no. I wanted no, to add no this. Worries, no worries, no worries. It's a unique no. opportunity, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>